This month's Sinister Year podcast is sponsored by Commonwealth Classics. Commonwealth Classics is a direct importer of classic vehicles from Europe and South America and has a rotating collection of rare and unique Land Rovers. Their showroom is located in Virginia, just 45 minutes west of Washington, D.C. Visit www.cwclassics.com to view their inventory of classic vehicles and follow them on Instagram at Commonwealth underscore Classics. Thank you, Commonwealth Classics, for your continued support of the podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the Center Steer Podcast, podcast number 103 for October 2021. Center Steer is a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. I'm your host, John Costage. Joining me via Zoom is Morgan and Harold. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. It's good to be back. Dixon's supposed to be here. It's Rover night for him, and apparently uh, he's probably forgot. <laughs> to join us today. <laughs> Maybe the sky creeper is on this no fly list or something. <laughs> yes. We were, we were trying to set this up and he's like, Oh, I have, I have a, a, a stop a stop time. We're like, okay, we'll start at, uh, we'll start at this time. And here we are. And he's, he's not here, but that's fine. Hopefully, uh, hopefully next time Dixon, if you are new to the podcast, welcome. We talk about Land Rovers, new, old, things they are capable of and the people who own and drive them. And if you're a returning listener, welcome back. Thank you for listening. An extra special thanks to our latest Patreon supporters, Bob, Jeff, and Kristen. We appreciate your support. You can visit our website to see how you can support the podcast. You can join Bob, Jeff, and Kristen as a Patreon supporter. You can buy a t-shirt or a sticker, and you can also buy us a tea. And that's just like Patreon, but uh, you get to choose the amount when you do buy, buy us a tea or buy me a tea. Or I think we should change it to buy us brown water. Well, for Bob, Bob needs a special button, brown water. (laughs) We were finally able to make contact with Australia. We talked with Justin Burton. Justin is is kind of, I guess, the organizer of Oxford in Australia. And Justin talked with us about uh, plans for Oxford in Australia, his Land Rover connections, and his very interesting collection of Land Rovers. Uh, This is your monthly reminder that in 2023 is Land Rover's 75th anniversary. We are inviting all Land Rover owners to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix in July of 2023, especially series and Defender owners. You now have 20 months to get your Rover ready. And stay tuned after we talk with Justin. I'll give you a review, so to speak, of Mar 2021. The It's the last one at Wheatland Farm, and we'll talk about the plans for Mar of 2022. Now for the news. First up is sales. JLR worldwide sales fell uh, 18.4% between July and September. It sold 92,710 cars, 20, 000, almost 21,000 cars fewer than the same three-month period last year. Uh, Jaguar sales were down almost 30% to 19,248 vehicles. Land Rover fell almost 15% to 73,462 vehicles. UK sales were down 47.6%. Dang. Yeah. Sales were (laughs) were lower year-on-year in most regions, including North America. North America was down 15.6%. China down 6.3%. Europe was down 17%. Those are sales numbers, right? So that's not like something that's the result of the chip shortage or anything, right? Uh, I think that was the number of produced vehicles. Yes, those like were sales. Those were vehicles sold. Okay. Now that okay. So I was just curious. That does that affected by pre-orders? Can you can you order them? That even though we can't produce them, we'll take your money and take your order, or or how's that all work? I'm not sure how their pre-order works. I don't know if you have to put a down payment down or not. I that's a good question. Don't know. Yeah, I don't recall whether they have a down payment, but uh, from what I read, this definitely does come from the the chip shortage and that they actually have like 125,000 vehicles, uh, at least on the Land Rover side, on order. Correct. Yeah, that's what they call that on the books, orders on the books, 125,000. That's probably mostly new defenders too. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Well, but that would also, if it's it's factoring in the chip shortage, that would explain why the new defender was still so much higher than all the other stuff. Cause that's the one they're, they're still making. Right. And, and it doesn't say it here and I've not heard it, but I suspect they're prioritizing building the defender too, with the chips that they do have. Yeah. They build the one that uses the most of them when, when you don't have any. It's also the hot model. Yeah. All 
models were lower with the exception of the new Defender as in, in individual sales. Uh, 16,725 vehicles sold were up 70% year on year for the new Defender. It was the best selling model of the quarter. Shocker. And to your point, Harold, uh, the company expects semiconductor shortages to gradually ease over in the next 12 months. Although I think that's just a they're hoping. I don't know that they actually know that. Yeah, I mean, you can say yeah, you can say stuff like that. I don't yeah. know if it's real. Reading about some other makes uh, that have cut back on production, but the one that hasn't is Toyota. I suspect Toyota was prepared for this, and since they're very large, they probably have a good supply of chips or good contracts with their with their makers. Maybe that's why everybody's short on them because Toyota's been hoarding. Very possible. <laughs> and speaking of the chip shortage, uh, they have Jaguar Land Rover paused how would car production for a week. Uh, this was, I think, last week, based on when we're recording. Uh, they were forced to shut down car production at the plant uh, because of a global shortage of computer chips. Assembly line workers returned to the factory in Merseyside a week after producing no vehicles. The plant makes the Dis Disco Sport and the Evoke models, although it has struggled with supply issues throughout the year. Uh, this is from Jalopnik, and this is a... Actually, I was hoping Dixon would join us because he wanted us to add the story in and the title is three three funny things are happening at jlr at the same time i'm not going to read the whole thing it's a little it's a short piece but there's a lot to it it kind of boils down to jaguar has their ipace which is a competitor to tesla and it's a, an upscale competitor to tesla and but it's not selling well and because it's not selling well uh, then JLR is going in and in going into a pool with other companies to get emission credits in Europe. So they do not get fined for not meeting emission uh, conditions and regulations. And the, the company that they're getting these credits from is Tesla. <laughs> yeah. It's this weirdness of, you know, I, I guess a car they expected that they was going to sell well and going to do well. And it was an all electric, the I-Pace was all electric and, and competing with Tesla not selling well, but now they're going to their competitor to get these emission credits. So they're buying emissions credits from their competitor so that they can in turn produce gas guzzling Range Rovers. Okay. Exactly. Well, not get fined. How about that, Harold? They're still, right, they, yeah, they can produce them right. But yeah. Well, yeah, but it's, it's the cap and trade thing to, to meet the, the yeah, numbers. Exactly. Yeah. And they, they did pay a fine last year. Yeah. They're just trying to prevent that. But yeah, you're, it's, it is funny that they're, through especially through the chip shortage focusing on like the defender and the range rovers uh their high-end market vehicles which are obviously the <laughs> the gas guzzlers yeah that's just silly to trade credits when doing that somewhat in their defense i think they seem to have a plan to have better emission producing vehicles is that a right phrase and they had a plan for that and then they had their financial difficulty. And then the, as they're trying to come out of that, then the then COVID strikes and they had, which pushed them back further. So it, I don't think it's completely that they weren't thinking about this or preparing for it. I think they did seem like they had a plan to do it. And then extraordinary things happen, which has caused them now to, you know, talk to their competitor about these credits. It's been a perfect storm in a lot of industries along these lines. Yep. And even with the sales that, at Jaguar down, what was it, 40%? Uh, the I-PACE was actually up. Um, but, you know, still, they're <laughs> probably having trouble getting chips for the all-electric vehicle, which uses even more chips, um, and so focusing on the, the high-ticket items. And probably batteries, too. Uh, they don't produce their own batteries, right? They get them from some other manufacturer, I, su I suspect. So there may be an issue there also. I mean, that's, you know, Ford is investing heavily into uh, into, into battery production and uh, other major car companies are moving into battery production, too. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't think JLR is ever going to have the size to justify a battery manufacturing facility. I think they're going to be buying them forever. I'd agree with that. Yeah. All right. Land Rover settles with Volkswagen over... Two similar off-road tech lawsuit, JLR has settled patent fights it lodged against Volkswagen and its brands over a feature used in luxury sport utility vehicles that simplifies off-road driving for affluent but inexperienced drivers. The agreements resolve litigation in Germany and the U.S., but other terms of the deals weren't disclosed with filings in courts in here in the U.S. with the International Trade Commission. 
Uh, the settlement came about a week before JLR, which is owned by Tata, was to begin a trial in which it was seeking to block imports of the into the U.S. of Volkswagen's Porsche, Lamborghini, Audi, and Volkswagen SUVs that Land Rover claimed used its patented terrain response technology without permission. Lawsuit has gone away, but there's no terms disclosed. W what will Volkswagen do? Are they going to name it something else? Or I guess we'll, we may find out eventually. I thought the, the real issue was that they were using a knob to control it. And that somehow, right, if they somehow <laughs> switched the push button or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. actually, you're right. It is a, the, 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 I didn't highlight this, but yeah, the next article, uh, paragraph says, the dispute was over an invention in which a simple turn of a knob instructs the vehicle systems to adapt to different terrains. <laughs> so now you use a push button or a lever or something. As long as it's not a knob. Right. Next up, Jaguar makes tools in-house after 1.7 million pound investment. JLR has started to make its own press tools in-house, for the first time, following a 1.7 million pound investment at its Hal Wood plant on Merseyside, the tools are the first stage in the manufacture of car body panels during new vehicle production. The parts had previously been made in Asia. Press parts manager uh, Niall Ford said, we bring in large coils of steel and then we unwind them and cut them in individual pieces and then we stamp them into the sides of our cars and the parts and go on to the underside. So it's, it's quite a critical part of the business. JLR makes the Evoke and the Discovery Sport at Hellwood, as we mentioned earlier. Kind of surprised that that was the first time they're doing that. I guess they hadn't done that previously. Well, Is anybody? I guess if it's cheaper to outsource, you do that. But now with all that, that supply chain stuff coming out of Asia, maybe they just find it's just a lot less hassle to make them in-house. Well, I wonder what they did back in the in the early days. Was that did maybe the Rover car company make them and they were other parts of the UK maybe? Uh, no, there was a company I thought that, that made stuff ended up being absorbed into British Leyland. I forget the name, but, but there was a big company that was making, uh, all the press steel. So I think it was, it was just easier to outsource. Right. Back then, you know, having a, a machine shop that, or well, not a machine shop, but a press shop <laughs> was just common still at that time. Whereas now it, it really, that trade is not in the uk anymore well and, and of course the the i don't know about the rover cars the land rover you didn't need much tooling to make those you could just bang them over a rock and there you go <laughs> that'll fit isn't that how they put the doors on right they put a piece of metal up and then they just kind of tapped and drilled in right pretty much <laughs> and i think the wings too they just put there and then some guy put his arm down rolled it over well i, I do know that, uh, from from experience that you cannot pull the tub skin off of one truck and put it on the other without moving all the holes <laughs> yes <laughs> because the, all the spot wells are just arbitrary wherever they felt like it that day yeah this looks like a spot uh here looks good Kachunk. how could that be inefficient no, no, not at all. Uh, who would who would do that for sixty some years and make it that way? I, I don't understand. Why would you do that? Sixty seven. Breaking news on the podcast: the two thousand twenty two Range Rover has been announced. It was actually announced yesterday, so it's not too breaking, but for us, it's breaking enough. In the nine years since the introduction of the current Range Rover, the luxury SUV market has undergone a transformational renaissance. What was once the only choice in the segment has had to fend off attacks from Mercedes, BMW, Audi, Bentley, Lamborghini, and Rolls-Royce. For 2022, the Range Rover is fighting back, armed with new technology popularized by its rivals, tweaked styling, and a new ultra-luxury interior. The new Range Rover is coming back for the throne. That starts with the incorporation of Dynamic Response Pro, Land Rover's branded name for 48-volt active anti-roll bar. Similar systems have proven transformative in SUVs like the, the Bentley Bentiaga, the, the Lamborghini, the secret ingredient that allows big 5,000-pound SUVs to corner as flat as sports car sedans without sacrificing ride quality. So it sounds like Range Rover is getting back at Volkswagen for having their knob appropriated by appropriating their suspension technology. Maybe <laughs> maybe that's the, the undisclosed terms of the deal. You can have your knob, we get your suspension. <laughs> <laughs> First year customers will be able to choose between the silky turbocharged Ingenium inline six, 395 horsepower, or the beefier 4.4 liter twin turbocharged V8, 523 horsepower. The 4.4 liter V8 is sourced from BMW, which is used in cars like the M55i and the X7, which has a uh, real geeky Land Rover people will know that the X series of BMW 
comes from Range Rover because that's when BMW bought Land, bought Land Rover, they got it so they could get Range Rover inf information for Land, uh, making their X-Series. The quickest version of the V8 should hit about 60 in 4.4 seconds. <laughs> Uh, everybody drink when I laugh at how fast a Land Rover goes in 60 seconds. One second per liter. That's not bad. Yeah, not bad at all. <laughs> Those more interested in efficiency will be glad to hear that a plug-in hybrid with 62 miles of all electric range will be added for the 2023 model and a fully electric Range Rover set to debut in 2024. And then an article after this talks a little more about that. Inside the third row seats are also available. A first for the full size Range Rover. So a third row of seats. The side profile now draws the eye to the abrupt and angular rear end, which has been stretched vertically and horizontally by a new rear lighting element in the shape of an elongated horseshoe. The design gives the Range Rover far more visual heft to differentiate it from its more streamlined Sport and Velar siblings. But the end result is no less sensational than the last model. I think we should clarify those taillights are actually not shaped like a horseshoe, but a polo pony shoe. Nicely done, Harold. Because, you know, let's let's get our, our context correct here. So we've talked on the podcast a lot about what is happening with the discovery, you know, the full size proper discovery. And I think seeing as I'm going to tell you in just a moment, what the price is of the new full size Range Rover, I think we are under, going to understand what's happening with discovery. So prices start for the full size new Range Rover, $105,350 American, including destination charges with the long wheelbase seven seat version kicking off at $111,000. Don't think it ends there. In an effort to stay on the top, Land Rover has continuously added to its list of ultra luxury options, a long wheel based first edition version with available lounge style rear seats and a V8 powertrain will set you back $163,850. Looks like deliveries are scheduled for spring of 2022. And they have a picture of the rear lounge seat. <laughs> It's like a plane in there. <laughs> it's really yeah. nice. <laughs> so if you have a spare 160 grand laying around, you can either go down to your dealer and plunk down for the new full fat Range Rover, or you can head on over to bring a trailer and buy yourself an old 110. Yes. <laughs> yes. Which will we have more fun with? Well, you know which way I'd go. Oh, absolutely. So a little bit more on the, the electric. This is from a different article, CNET. They say a full electric version of the Range Rover is on the way. It's supposed to debut in 2024. Expect at least one electric motor at each axle with a range of around 300 miles and a power output of at least 600 horsepower. Uh, in the, and this is in the meantime here, the Range Rover will gain plug-in hybrid model for the 2023 model year in place of the old PHEV four-cylinder engine. The new one uses JLR's Ingenium turbocharged three-liter inline six paired with a 38.2 kilowatt hour battery pack and an electric motor integrated in the transmission. In total, the PHEV puts out 434 horsepower and Land Rover claims an EV range of 62 miles, more than three times that of the outgoing model. So that's the upcoming full-size Range Rover all-electric, which will probably start at over $100,000 just because that's what the price is now for that. Well, it's got to go for more than the, the gasoline version, which the gasoline version starts at 106. So the electric's got to be north of 110, even as a base model electric. Right. You know, the, the new design is, is certainly a little more aerodynamic than the outgoing design, not drastically, but I wonder how much that has to play with the increased all electric range. Oh, because it looks more sleek and the, the sides yeah, are completely smooth because they're using the Velar door handles. Right. Yeah, because that actually is an incredibly large factor in in range. Well, drag reduction affects fuel mileage or or electron mileage the same way. So, you know, energy is energy. It has to come from somewhere to propel the vehicle. Yeah. So the less drag you have, the less energy you use. And the less energy you pull out of your battery, the longer you can do it. Precisely. Interesting on the design. It the front still, to me, looks like a standard traditional Range Rover, but the side looks a lot like the Velar, very smooth, and and uh, it's not straight, but it has that kind of rounded roundedness to it. And then it goes almost like a torpedo in the back, uh, in, in, you know, like tr traditional torpedo kind of tapers to the back. So I'm wondering, what's good then the new Velar going to be like? How, how are they going to differentiate it from the full size? But they'll probably just taper the 
taper the, the rear hatch down as they do currently. It'll just be a scale model of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> maybe, maybe with like a two inch roof chop, less greenhouse in the Velar. And the new one, I think it's the biggest ever Range Rover. This thing looks massive. I don't know if it's the, uh, how the, how it's designed that it looks large. There's nothing to break up the, the side, but it certainly looks very large. I wonder if it is larger. But I thought I read that it was the largest, longest uh, Range Rover. It certainly would make sense that they've, you know, with the long wheelbase now managed to fit in a seventh, uh, <laughs> a third row, <laughs> you know, seven passengers. None of us have asked the question, how does it do off-road? <laughs> 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 who's, who's the first to take their uh, 100,000 plus vehicle off-road? My prediction is it will be a resident of the Commonwealth of Virginia. Those guys just, they throw money down on that stuff and then they beat the crap out of it in the woods. They don't care. All right, well, move on to the new Discovery. I think as we've talked about the new Range Rover, and I think we're starting to see now where things are going to fit and what's happened with the what we previously thought was a lost model, the Discovery. And they're coming out in 2023. They've revealed the uh, Discovery Metropolitan Edition. So sitting at the top of the Discovery lineup, the new Metropolitan Edition provides a host of exterior upgrades and standard features, including a powerful 355 horsepower, three liter Ingenium six cylinder powertrain featuring a 48 volt mild hybrid technology. And this is from Finbar McFall, the Land Rover brand director. He says the introduction of the Metropolitan Edition brings a new level of premium appeal to the Land Rover Discovery. The 2023 Land Rover Discovery is priced, this is the, this is the non-Metropolitan Edition, is priced at $56,000 in the U.S. The Metropolitan Edition is available to order at $75,300 U.S. So so the Disco is reestablishing itself as the poor man's full-size Range Rover. Yes, Especially now that the Range Rover's gone, to, I guess, ultra luxury. Uh, is that beyond premium now? It sounds like it's disc, Disco's moved into the premium category. Well, well, the full fat Range Rover has, but there's still plenty of other stuff that that carries the Range Rover name that is not. I mean, you can spend less on a Range Rover than you can on a Disco if you want to get one of the small ones. Right. Yeah. But for full size, right. If part you're of the family, full size to full size, then then yeah. I mean the the. The disco is like half the cost of the of the full fat. So I, I guess it, it took the new Range Rover to figure out and finally reveal what's happened to the to all three families: the Range Rover family, the Discovery family, and the Defender family. Don't want to spend six figures? Well, here let's take a look at a disco. And it's priced at what full size Range Rover used to be. Yeah. Uh, Defender news: Land Rover Defender Hybrid confirmed for U.S. Car Buzz has discovered that the 2022 Land Rover Defender PHEV was uploaded to. Uh, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's website, which means it has been registered in the U.S. The Defender PHEV is equipped with the same turbocharged four-pot as used in the P300 models. It gets a P400E badge, which is the first clue as to how potent this plug-in can be. The gas engine works alongside a 141 horsepower electric motor which results in a combined power output of 398 horsepower, 470 pound-feet of torque. It gets the Defender to 60 miles an hour in. <laughs> Anybody want to guess how, how quick a new Defender? 5.2. Morgan? Uh, I'm going to say 5.5. Five. Right around it, 5.4 seconds. New Defender, 0 to 60, 5.4 seconds, the PHEV model. And this makes it the quickest Defender not equipped with a supercharged V8. Uh, Land Rover claims it's capable of doing 71 miles per gallon E in all electric mode. It can cover 27 miles and using DC rapid charging, it will charge 80% in 30 minutes. And from your standard wall uh, box, it would take about uh, two hours to get to 80%. The PHEV uses the same permanent four-wheel drive system and train response trickery as any other model, so it will keep on working even if you run the battery down. So that is your new coming Defender Hybrid. I certainly think that that's going to be a fun model off-road because 27 miles is a decent range in pure electric, which is great off-road to be completely silent, just rolling along. Yeah, except all the people standing on the side of the trail might not hear you coming at them. That's right. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, unless you hit something, you know, a tree, a rock. I wonder how much that range gets reduced while you're winching. Ooh, good point. So so is, is JLR planning to do a, a charging network? I've not heard anything about that. 
Or is it strictly going to be a, an at-home thing? Probably be an at-home thing. There is discussion here in the U.S. I've seen some rumblings, rumors, whatever word you want to use, of there being a common charging type. Uh, Tesla, I know they've set up their own charging network, but they use a proprietary plug. There's right. discussions of using a standard uniform plug across the country. Ford, I believe, has talked about coming out with their own network. I think even General Motors has talked about coming out of their own network. I don't know if they're going to be sharing any of their the plug-in types, you know, where it is understood you know, that having a common plug as a would be a boon to the to the industry uh, versus having proprietary plugs for different vehicles and different charging uh, capabilities. I wonder if that could be accomplished with just like an adapter, like like when you travel to Europe, you need the little thing to put between <laughs> right. your plug and the wall. To- <laughs> and you can take that big one that when you go to the UK, they've got the two prongs that go the wrong yeah, way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, you have your universal adapters. You drive around the world. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I just read an article, and I probably should have sent it over to you, but Porsche slash Audi, and I'm not sure if Volkswagen is part of this or not, but they just evaluated their global charging network. They have determined that their network is now delivering 1.21 gigawatts. (laughs) Sweet. (laughs) Just in time for Back to the Future Day. Excellent. You know, with Tesla uh, having their standard, I I wouldn't be surprised if smaller companies like Land Rover might join with say Tesla to use their network or, or maybe use their proprietary plug. That Pay some sort customers. of licensing fee to access their, right. And that's, that's an interesting way to do it. Yeah. I, I could see that happening because also Tesla, while they are competitors, they've also have given away. And even though they have patents on certain things for the, for electric vehicles, they've allowed other people to use those patents and not held them. So it's possible they may, see that as beneficial to the industry in general. I would think that licensing access to their charging network is no different than like BMW selling engines to everybody. All right. Uh, Cars.com has a short article here, the 2021 Land Rover Defender, six pros and five cons. And I thought it was worth looking at these, especially the cons, because we usually just hear about the good things. But the good things are it gets going. Uh, as we know, it's pretty quick. Uh, the four-door Defender, three-liter V6, gets a respectable 395 horsepower. Quick shifting, the Defender's eight-speed automatic transmission downshifts eagerly at highway speeds. It's surprisingly agile. The tall front seating position affords a commanding view, forward view, ensuring the person behind the wheel can plan ahead. A lot to stow for, clever, convenient, Stuff stashing spaces, say that three times, include a cabin spanning recess dashboard face. We know it's an ode to the series trucks. Uh, large door pockets and an open storage area where the center console meets the dash that's like open behind the, under the dash behind the center console. And the final one here is intuitive technology, which I think this is this is a good thing because it's a turnaround for a problem that JLR had in their entertainment system. The Defender's single 10-inch dash-mounted touchscreen with uh, physical climate controls positioned just below make it easy to use. And Land Rover's PIVI Pro multimedia system boasts intuitive, vividly renders menus and navigation. So those are your, your pros on it, which is the first time I think we've not heard a bad thing about their entertainment system. So that's a that's a good thing that the PIVI Pro seems to be a, an improvement. Or at least it's the first time we've we've seen anything related to their infotainment being listed in a pro column. In a positive way. <laughs> yes. yeah. Whether or not it also appears in the con is yet to be, be seen. But. And the five things they don't like hindsight not exactly 2020 the broad b pillars and full size spare tire mounted on the swing gate conspire to compromise over the shoulder and rear visibility respectively in other words spring for that available rear view camera mirror that displays a live feed of what's coming up behind you that help eliminate at least the blind no, spot no worse than a soft top with no windows in the side <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> yeah and honestly most vehicles at this point have horrendous rearward views they do. Hence the requirement over here for rear view cameras. Uh, I've put a clear sight backup camera in, the, in my Defender and it's fantastic. I, makes, it makes a world difference. You can put stuff in the back of the vehicle and, and you can still see out what's happening behind you. Unless, of course, it's nighttime, in which case the you know, headlights, you know, one giant blob of, of uh, white light behind you. Yeah, you know, just drive forward. Yeah, most people are challenged enough just to be watching ahead of them. Yes, that's true. Another negative here. Uh, first, I've heard this. This is backseat put down. The two-row Defender 110's 40-20-40 split backseat 
seat also uses an older folding design that's surprising to see in an an all new vehicle. Rather than simply folding the backrest to extend the cargo floor, you must first flip the seat cushion forward to get a flat four. So you fold the seat cushion forward, then I guess the backrest comes down. So it takes a lot of effort to restore the heavy setbacks uh, seat backs to their upright position also. Whereas I think the disc goes completely flat, right? I mean, they've had a, since what, the LR3, the LR4, and now the, the D5, they're all completely flat in the back. I haven't really seen those, you know, flip the seat base up and then fold the back down since the like Toyota 4Runners, like the 90s and early 2000s ones. That's definitely an old design. But if they have the newer design because they're doing it in the other models, interesting that they couldn't carry over too. That's that's the way the our, you know the my Jetta works. That's a, yours. Yours is the same way, and that's a thirteen, so that's a little newer, but still, that's. You know, I mean, it works for some stuff, maybe not so much for others. Uh, next is comfort compromise from the jump uncon- uncomfortable seating position. This is the center jump the jump seat. When I say from jump, I mean the center jump seat is uncomfortable, and and may make a middle passenger want to jump out of the jump seat. <laughs> Well, I mean, come on. Some things some things never change. I mean, it's a middle seat. What are you expecting? Yeah, exactly. At least you're not constantly getting elbowed every time the driver shifts. Well, there you go. Right, or have to move yeah, move your legs and all that. Yeah. Well, that takes some of the sport out of it. <laughs> yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> Next, fewer doors, less cargo space in the two-door Defender. That's the D90. Cargo space behind the back seat is stingy, and the seat doesn't fold flat with a cargo floor pack light and having seen one which i'll tell you about later in the program i actually drove the uh, defender 90 uh that jeff aronson had borrowed yeah there's very little room in the back uh, you might be able to put a golf bag sideways fit in there and that's about it not a lot of room but it's a 90 you don't buy them for the cavernous space exactly right you are correct and finally, a swing and a miss. Defender's rear swing gate is fine when you're off-roading in wide open spaces, but it can make things tricky when you're parallel parking in the in the city and trying to get your groceries up to your apartment uh, before your chunky monkey melts. <laughs> I think they didn't change the, the door either for North America, so it opens against the side of the road that you're typically on, like my Defender does. Exactly, yeah, they did not change that. And, you know, I, I have to say that actually it's probably going to be less of a problem in the U.S. because we generally tend to design for a lot more cars, even in our cities. And so a lot less of parking is parallel parking. But still, it it would be a pain in the city. And the parallel parking spaces are laid out for longer vehicles than the 90s. So Yeah, but what if you have a 110 and you're <laughs> trying to get something out of the back? Well, you know what? Put your important stuff in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> Where it belongs. Exactly. Yeah, that's where you keep your ice cream. You put your ice cream right in the in the side door. You can get it quickly and go. Harold, you're missing you're missing <laughs> something here. That's what that pen panier penier is for on the side. Can you, the, the pollen sack. Yes, you don't, that way you just put you, you can put I your. I don't ice- think I don't think it's thick enough to get a pint in there. <laughs> Maybe you can stand up an ice cream cone. See, you're missing something. That could be the opportunity there to keep it as a little cooler, put some ice in there. It would have to be a thicker case. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It, yeah. I'm sure it's not insulated. But, yeah, that could be like a new pack that they have, the the ice cream run pack, some sort of electrically cooled outer thing on the side that you put your Ben and Jerry's into. Well, couldn't you run route a, a tube from the air condition system into there and then like they do with the with the glove boxes to cool those. You could, you could, or, or just one of those thermoelectric cooler things. Yep. That's a good idea. Those aftermarket for someone to get onto. All right, let's move on to Enos unveils fuel cell SUV prototype announces hydrogen production plans. Enos uh, announced a $2.3 billion investment in what the British chemical company calls green hydrogen production while also unveiling prototype fuel cell version of its planned Grenadier SUV. The investment will fund hydrogen plants in Norway, Germany, Belgium, and the UK to be used to produce hydrogen through electrolysis. The company already operates some electrolysis plants, though it's through its a subsidiary and claims to be the largest operator of such plants in Europe. The fuel cell Grenadier prototype uses Hyundai powertrain technology. The two companies signed a memorandum of understanding in 2020 to collaborate on fuel cell projects. While Enos has only shown the single prototype so far, a production version is now expected around 2024. The Grenadier is scheduled to launch in the United States in 2023, 
To keep things simple, Enos plans one powertrain, a three liter turbocharged inline six from BMW. It will be coupled to an eight speed automatic transmission, four wheel drive system with a two tr speed transfer case. A diesel will be offered in other markets. Enos has indicated US pricing will fall somewhere between mainstream off roaders like the Bronco and the Wagoneer and the more luxurious uh, Mercedes G Class. It's a pretty big window. <laughs> So how are they producing the power for those electrolysis plants? So it takes a lot of electricity to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Well, I guess that's why they invested $2.3 billion. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking that's kind of the hang up in doing the whole hydrogen thing is you've got to make the hydrogen. And, and if you're trying to make hydrogen to save the environment, you're killing the environment, making the hydrogen with which to save the environment. Yeah, since they said one of the plants was Norway, right? Maybe they're doing hydro on the fjords. Yeah, I just don't know if you can make enough to, to you know, it'd be a small production, I, I guess. You just wanted to say hydro in the fjords. <laughs> it's true. Hydro in the fjords. <laughs> a Land Rover Defender with aircraft-inspired camper is out of this world. The Duckworth Air Rover, that's A-E-R-O-V-E-R, -E -E is a new overlander from England that combines the frame and front of an old Land Rover Defender, we'd say heritage, with a body taking inspiration from a 1930s aero style trailer. Think of the classic Airstream. It's handsome machine and Duckworth is now looking for a customer who wants to commission a personalized interior for this first build. Duckworth starts with a new Defender 130 galvanized chassis and fits a self-leveling air suspension. The company uses a TD5 2.5 liter five-cylinder turbo diesel, redundancy there, with modifications like new fuel injectors and a remapped engine management system. Tweaks to the clutch make shifting easier and as an alternative, a customer can specify a BMW X5 engine and gearbox. Duckworth makes the rear living area from an aluminum frame with aluminum panels riveted to it. The company has to craft each piece by hand, composite materials act as reinforcements for vulnerable areas. What's the uh, projected price on that? There is so if no you have to ask, listed price, sir. You can't afford. I suspect might be less than a new Range Rover, though. That's my sus I don't know. I suspect. Considering that, that back half's made by hand, and and they're 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 building you a one thirty on top of that, which which isn't exactly cheap. If you're using a TD five, would that that's not doesn't meet the twenty five year rule here in the U S. Right? So you couldn't import this one. No, you could not. So, so therefore, Correct. it doesn't matter. Yeah. So no American buyers need apply. Well, but on the other hand, they said that they, they could, uh, for money, make you one with a BMW, which means for money. If you had the money and you wanted it in this country, you could probably convince them to put in an engine that is legal. So if you're interested in a cool-looking Defender-type camper... Uh, Duckworth is waiting to hear from you. Please give us some money. We'd like to build one. And uh, let them know that the podcast sent you and uh, we'd like to ride in it, maybe drive it if you get to, if we get the opportunity. And finally, in the news, uh, this is a SAS spec Land Rover gunship. It is a target for enthusiasts at auction. The one-off Series 3 109 is fitted with dummy machine guns that have been restored by vintage Land Rover specialist John Brown 4x4. It's available at uh, Sotheby's auction. Uh, the auction is completed, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. The left-hand drive machine was built by Land Rover at its Birmingham plant in 1984 and is thought to have been used by the German Air Armed Forces. Two military enthusiasts in York bought the vehicle in 2010, carried out a replication to SAS specifications. Both machine guns, a 30 and a 50 cal, are dummy weapons professionally made by Crossfire, and the Landy is completely road legal to drive. So it looks like a Pink Panther, but kind of like a modernized version of the Pink Panther, but it's not in pink. It's uh, green and sand. So so just to be clear, this is a, a civilian vehicle. It's a tribute. It's not not an ex-military. No, I think it's ex-military German, though. Oh, okay, so it yeah. isn't. Okay, but but it was built right. not not in this configuration for the military. It was yes. a, a couple of civilians that, that got themselves an old ex-military series truck and said, let's do... Yes, correct. Let's yeah. do the let's Let do the Pink Panther without the pink paint. Right. That's that's my impression of that. Yeah. I think it's to the the SAS spec. So right. Like they probably was, had some in production. Well, the like SAS uh, Rover was was usually better known as the Pink Panther because they used so many of them in the desert in the sand. But if they were using them somewhere else, they would be in a color that wasn't pink. Yeah. 
it's still functionally pretty much the same truck. True. We'll have links in the show notes, of course, with the, there's a bunch of pictures you can look at. It doesn't uh, have the tire in the front, uh, in front of the grill, as you would expect. Blocking the airflow. Blocking the airflow, yes. <laughs> Which I never thought made sense in the hot desert. But. Right. So it did sell uh, at auction and it went uh, for 11,000 pounds sold. That's actually not bad. No, I actually, that was pretty good. There's uh, more detail here on the uh, Sotheby's site. It's an 84 Series 3 109, and they call it military style, based on long wheel be- wheelbase version of the Series 3, fitted with a 2.25 liter inline four petrol four speed manual gearbox, believed to have been delivered new to military forces overseas. Registered in the UK, uh, converted to quote unquote SAS specification featuring dummy machine gun. Uh, the dummy guns we talked about, spare wheels, jerry cans, special soft road equipment are mounted to the body. Light recommissioning work in 2020 by Land Rover specialist John Brown 4x4 included fan belt replacement, brake service, new front shock absorbers, odometer just over 65,000 kilometers at time of cataloging. You know, that would be legal to import to the U.S. under the 25 year rule. Oh, because it's an 84. It's an 84, right. and it's got the original two and a quarter. It's not, not been updated, so it's it's got the original inch engine so it is eligible for the for the 25 year exemption i just wonder what customs would think of all the fake guns all over it <laughs> could you have them sent separately yeah i would assume i mean yeah anything parts is parts but so oh, honestly if they probably care less about that than <laughs> whether it's a 25 year mark <laughs> land rover Probably. And I suspect you could probably get some sort of certificate along with it saying that the guns are all fake. If you, there was your chance, if you were interested in a SAS spec owed to military vehicle Land Rover, someone has purchased it, to, you need to reach out to Sotheby's. So that is the news for October 2021. And now on this Understeer podcast, it's time for Oxford in Australia. Joining us from Queensland is Justin Burton. Welcome to the program, Justin. Hi, and hi, everybody. So Queensland on Australia, that's uh, Queensland is a state, right? Or- Queensland is a state, a big state, yes. And that's where Sydney is, right? Oh, Sydney is about 960 kilometers away. Wow. So that's, in, that's in New South Wales, right? That's in New South Wales, yes, that's over the okay. border. In fact, we've got our borders about 30 minutes from where I live, and we technically, we can go over the border, but we're not allowed to come back really at the moment because of COVID. <laughs> really? <laughs> Which is... We're so fact, laughing. You know, so, you know, I, I mean, we shouldn't really talk about COVID too much, but it's bizarre. But in, on the 1st of November, you can actually fly from Sydney to London Heathrow, but you can't fly from Brisbane to Sydney. <laughs> Okay. Well, you know, it, so, odd COVID stuff here in North America, yeah. you could have flown from Canada to the U.S., but you couldn't cross the border in a vehicle. <laughs> bizarre, isn't it? It was very bizarre. Yeah, so Dixon can fly in and play with Land Rovers, but he can't drive it home. That's right. You know, t- how did how did uh, Oxford get to Australia? And tell us that, a little bit about that story. And also, what are what's the plans for Oxford in Australia? Well, I was talking to a good friend of mine, Mike Bishop, Oh, you've obviously been on your show um, from Land Rover Classic. And it just came up in conversation. Uh, we were actually talking about the 75th anniversary event down at Kuma, which hopefully will go ahead. Um, and I was really just trying to judge with Mike at the time, you know, what involvement Land Rover would have in the 75th. But he just, he was basically, it's far too um, in the future for them to even make a decision. Um, and then we just got on to, to Oxford and um Basically talked about Adam, who obviously owns Oxford, being a Yorkshireman as well, like myself. And, um, yeah, and I, I just basically touched base with um, Rod Corbin, who I think you've had on, on the show. Correct. Yep. I had a chat with Rod, and we actually flew over. I think we flew over in May, um, not to see Oxford. I think Oxford was up in storage in one of the other island. But we went, ha- went to Rod's house for dinner, met his lovely wife, which was really nice, talked about Land Rovers. I think that was in Wanaka. And yeah, and we basically, it went from there, really. We decided it would be a good thing for us to do. I mean, you know, we, we do have a business. We sell Land Rover spares and accessories, but we are actually enthusiasts and we're very passionate about the brand. Good. Whereas a lot of companies, you know, just um, <laughs> just sell the parts and they're there to make the money. Whereas 
we, you know, we are you know, very enthusiastic. Um, so I thought it was a, it was a good thing to get Oxford here and basically, you know, get the Land Rover community on board. The only stumbling block, and I'll be honest with you, with this one is that we had zero <laughs> input from Land Rover Australia. Not bothered one little bit, which which was a shame. And, and in fact, Mike Mike told me that when I spoke to Mike and. Um, it's a shame because I think in America and certainly in New Zealand, Land Rover in those countries have really supported Oxford on his journey. Which, uh, more, more so in New Zealand, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, but so for here, it's it's obviously a logistical, not a nightmare, but for, to get Oxford from one state to another is is quite a big undertaking and, and it's costly, as in it could be anything up to, you know, $1,500 to... Um, transport Oxford each way every time it goes somewhere. So for us, we are looking at how we can kind of find, well, we, we can't financially support that, but Oxford, we get, we've get we got people on board and we've got clubs on board for when the borders open. So hopefully he can start visiting other states like he, like similar to what he did in New Zealand, really. He came in July, which was amazing. Um, he actually got here. It was a bit of a, sh- of a shock because he was going to go on a, on a vessel direct to, Australia, but had to go all the way to Japan on a row row, and then all the way so sail past, sail past us, and then came back. But it was all good. Obviously, obviously he failed quarantine because we've got some of the strictest quarantine um, rules in the world. And even though Rod and his team did a fantastic job cleaning Oxford, you never, I've never had a Land Rover ever, ever that has passed inspection. Even my Camel Trophy, what came, which is a nut and bolt restoration, they still had to go and clean it. Wow. Um, but anyway, Oxford came, and it was actually when he came on the transporter, started first time, and I must admit, I, when I first sat in that car, I was just like, wow. It was just like, mm-hmm. wow, I'm in this little Land Rover. And yeah. we, just drove it, we just drove it around the um, complex where work is, and I was just like, oh, my God. It was just such an amazing feeling. Um, yeah. Gets to you, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It does. And I just, yeah, it's, it's hard to explain, you know, and it's such a significant, I say to people who are not into Land Rover, you know, that particular vehicle holds, you know, in, in history, motoring history, it's very significant, you know, being one of the two first vehicles ever to do an overland expedition. So it's not just, you don't, I don't think you just have to be into Land Rovers to appreciate what Oxford is and where he came from. It, it's it, we've had to do the same here. Explain what what Oxford meant here in the U.S. and many people just don't 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 get it. But you do your best. I had yeah. Oxford at my house for a night, and, and I just tell my friends it's a lot like Elvis dropping by and crashing on your couch. <laughs> <laughs> I, I walk into work every day and I see I see Oxford. And I'm like, he's still you know, and it's it's been difficult with with the rest- we've had some quite severe lockdowns as well in Queensland snap lockdowns where you can't do anything so trying to plan events has been difficult um we were lucky though once we got um Oxford we so we did a an MOT or a roadworthy as you might I don't know what you call it over there you know inspection. to get the tickets we put it yeah and a road inspection um and we, the first event we did was a great event. We had about 40 Land Rovers and we did, we went down to Surface Paradise, which is a little bit like um, the Glitter Strip, I suppose, in Miami, big skyscrapers overlooking the ocean. And then we went out to the countryside, the hinterland, we went to a lovely vineyard for a dinner. So, And then we ended up at the car museum, which um, we got a, a car museum or a motor museum, which opened about a year ago. Uh, they're very supportive of, of classic cars. So we had a dinner there. So it was nice to get, Oxford out on his first little adventure. So this motoring museum opened up in the middle of COVID. What's its uh, what's its focus and where is it located? Literally about ten minutes over that hill. <laughs> from where I am. And for for, for um, those listening at home, he's pointing ahead. <laughs> top, yeah, I'm looking at the video, but there's no video for everybody else. It's just audio. Yes, it's so, literally. So about turn it. around and look behind you as you listen to this. <laughs> It's it's lived, it's at the bottom of a place called Tambourine Mountain, and Tambourine Mountain's a rainforest in the hinterland, which is the countryside, which would you call it if you lived in England. Um, so yeah, I think it's been open a year and a little bit. Um, it's a good because it's not just full of boring Australian Holdens and Fords. Because obviously the Aust- diehard Australians love the Holdens and they love the Fords. So it's got a, a vast array of cars. It's not even got a DeLorean in there. 
So, Some of us non-Australians like the Holdens and and the. <laughs> I can't stand them. <laughs> well, I mean, but you're you're used to them. For us, they're unique. They're special. They're different. Yeah, but I don't. There's a lot more European cars here now, which is, I mean, they don't make Holdens anymore in Australia or Fords. I don't think. Yeah, they don't make Holdens anywhere anymore. No. Um, Actually, for a hot minute, they sent Holdens to America as Pontiac G8s. They, they sent them to the UK, the, the Ute version. I think there was a HRV, a V8 or something. I don't think the Brits kind of warmed to them, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, I don't think they could afford the fuel. <laughs> so so the, what's the next event then coming up you, for Oxford? Yeah, so we did the Gold Coast. Uh, we did an event with Land Rover at the Gold Coast. We worked very closely with our local dealer. That was a fantastic day. They really went out there. They had a band on. They had a coffee cart, you know, donuts, cakes and things. So people just came down and we had, I think it was probably for, probably the first time maybe in 40 or 50 years that every single car in the showroom was a manual. Wow. And I think... You know, you think about now and Land Rover's range, there's no manuals in the range anymore. Nope. And and it was just, we had, there was a 50, 55, there was Oxford, there was a Camel Trophy, there was a 73 Range Rover 3 door, some Defenders, um, Adventurer, uh, Heritage, plus some some E-Type Jaguar. So it was it was good. There was, there was old Jags as well as Land Rover. And it was a really good morning. Lots of people came down and, had the photographs taken, you know, that's that, that, that pause sure. in Oxford with you. Mm. <laughs> with well, with you out the that's a, that's a yeah. lot of oil slicks in the parking lot. We had, um, I mean, we must have had maybe 15, 20 oil trays in the showroom. Cause you know what yeah. showrooms are like, beautiful yeah. floors. But so that went down well. Um, what have we done? And then, well, the next, our next, um, outing, we're going up to the sunshine coast. So that's further North. And we're going to be going and doing an event with the um, Sunshine Close Land Rover Club probably next month in November. And then plans after will depend on um, the borders opening, uh, whenever that may be. Uh, we, we wanted to do a big run down to the Northern Rivers, which I don't know whether you've ever heard of Byron Bay. It's quite synonymous. Uh, Chris Hemmingsworth, actor, he lives there. Lots of famous people live in Byron, but it's a trendy place. But it's lovely down there. It's a lovely part of the coast. Um, so we'll, we'll, as soon as the borders open, we'll do a, a weekend run down there. And then we've got probably April or May, we've got Oxford's Outback Expedition plan. So we're going to take Oxford actually to proper Australia, which is the desert. And we, it's a 12, 14 day trip. I'm hopeful we could have probably up to 150 Land Rovers. Um, so I've done a couple of trips myself over the years. It's quite slow going, but it's it's good because everywhere we go in other than one place, it's got a pub. So that's very important. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's not just about having fun with Land Rovers. It's also supporting the communities out there, which have been absolutely devastated with COVID, you know, very little tourism. So we'll inject some money back into those communities as well as having a great time with lots of Land Rovers. Do you expect to drive Oxford around or is it going to be trailered and then maybe driven locally? Well, it takes two days to get to the start of where, <laughs> where we're going. <laughs> right. So yes. we will put, we've got a big truck now. We've got a big car transport. So we'll, we'll take Oxford down on the car transport and we're actually going to start off in a place called Burke. And then we go through basically to Inner Minka, Cameron Corner. There's a place called the Dig Tree, which is a very famous Burks and Wills who the explorers going back in the day. Um, so there's, there's a lot of history as well where we're going. And, you know, some of those places, there is literally just a pub in the, the town is a pub. And there's two people live in the town, but that's the pub. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, if there's so, a yeah, pub, there's it, a town. Yeah, but, but driving, uh, I've done it in series vehicles before. It's not its not difficult. Um, probably the longest day will be like 300 kilometres. The shortest day might be about 120. It's, it's no race. It's just, no. and people will, will get a chance to drive Oxford a little bit and, you know, enjoy what Oxford's all about. Do you intend to take Oxford to, you know, different club events or take it on, I assume there are good off-roading and uh, trail rides, I assume, in Australia. Well, we've 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 spoken to a number of clubs again <clears throat> once the borders open. But we've got the, the I understand. City. Yeah, the whole COVID yeah. Yeah, obviously is a big asterisk here. Yeah. It is. But we've we've already talked to a few groups. So there's a Sydney Land Rover Club. Um, there's a club of the ACT. 
Melbourne. I think all those people want to come on board and do things. In fact, a great one, and I've never been to Tasmania. I had, um, is it, it's not really, a, there is a club down there, but this is a group of individuals, there's about 30 of them, and they're not part of the club for whatever reason, but they were like, we'll pay your expenses to come down, we'll put you on the ferry, we'll lend you a car if you need a car, come down to um, Tasmania. So that's certainly, that'll be a really good event. I've got a really good friend of mine, who amazing video production. So we're actually making a video of everything that we're doing. And then we'll probably launch this video after the 75th. Um, so that's, that's all pretty exciting. Are you going to have some uh, location, say on Facebook or something for folks to follow the journey? We'll just set up a YouTube channel. So we, it'll be small snippets of thing of, of, of video where we go. Um, and then obviously after the 75th, uh, which I think that'll be hopefully Oxford's last stand in Australia. Also, uh, if it goes ahead, you intend for Oxford to stay there through 2023. Yeah. Adam wants, I'm happy for um, Oxford to stay until what's that? 2023. Yep. So that'll be April, May, 2023. Right. Yeah. A- April would be is the, is the official month. Oxford ought yes. to be well preserved in a, in a dry place like Australia. That. Well, yeah, I mean, we don't have, we don't certainly don't have the salt on the road like they do in the UK. Um, or, or here. That's or not, Canada. That's not, <laughs> that's not to say. No, that no, no, no. Salt. Canada has a little bit of road underneath the salt. Mm. Okay, that's fair. And in Quebec, they don't, they don't even put down salt. They just plow and they leave a couple inches of, of snow and then you have to have snow tires anyway. We do have snow in Australia though. I'll just that, you know, we do have lots of snow. When? Okay, in, the, in, in the stores, right? You have to buy it special, special order? No, it's called the Snowy Mountains. In fact, it's where where it all started for Land Rover, you know, the Snowy Mountain Hydro scheme, where those first 200 Land Rovers actually came to Australia. But down there, there's some very, very good ski runs and ski resorts. Perisher, I think, Jindabyne down there. But they get they get down to minus 10, minus 15 in winter. Okay, yeah, that's, right. that's, that's legit. Cool. That's all legit. Right. I know I didn't know when I came here and I flew and I remember the first time I ever came to Australia and I'm looking out of the plane, I actually thought how green it was. I never, there was really no desert flying down the coast. And then I found out about the snow. I've not been down there, but yeah, it's very, very popular. And that's the Snowy Mountain? That's in New South Wales? No, the Snowy Mountains and Cooma is where the 75th is and that's where basically it's near, near the snowy mountains hydro scheme so that's where, where and i think that's the golden thing in land rovers over here people are, are trying to find those early series ones can you actually tell us about that story because we don't we're not familiar with that that's not part of uh, the, the land rover lore here at least in north america is this uh, scheme you were talking about the where land rovers i guess what first were used in australia yeah, well, if you yeah, if you get a chance, Google um, the Snowy Mountains hydroelectric scheme, which is I think it was probably one of the is the biggest engineering project ever undertaken in Australia. So to build hydroelectric in the mountains, making dams and tunnels. Um, but when that project started, that's the first two. Some of the first two hundred fifty Land Rovers actually went to that particular project over its time. I think it was a twenty, maybe twenty five year. Nineteen forty nine to nineteen seventy four. Yes, yeah, a long time, and a lot of migrants came as well. You know, it has a lot of brought of a lot of workers into the into the country. So there's a lot of it's not just all Australians. I think the, you know a lot of those communities have a, a, a big mix of you know different people, mm-hmm. non-indigenous as they would say. Right. Um, but finding if you find a, a series one from the the Snowy Mountain scheme, yeah, they, they they're fetching good money. Not that they found all of them, but <laughs> were they all series ones? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. The first, the first lot, were, yeah. So the intent is to have Oxford at, at some event that's going to take place then at, at the uh, Snowy Snowy Hydro. It's really Land Rover's um, historical home they, down down there because that's where it really all began. So they that's why the event is held down at Cooma, uh, and it, and it usually every ten years. But the seventieth was such an amazing event. Um, in fact, it was. I'll tell you a little bit, a little bit of a funny thing here. So, Nick Rogers, who's one of the directors of Land Rover in the UK, and he's and he's a fanatical fan. He's, I think he's got a series one himself. The organisers were trying to contact somebody high up in Land Rover, and and it didn't it didn't go up the chain of command like you know it rarely does. And he found out two weeks before the seventieth was about 
to, to happen. And he was told, and he was like, well, why, why didn't why didn't anybody you know tell me sooner? And he got on a plane, <laughs> flew out to the 70th, and he had to sleep on somebody's floor because there was no hotels. There was there was nothing, and he he was part. He was with my bishop actually, who were doing the um, compare. I think the word isn't it when you're on the stage and you're introducing, etc. and whatever. But um, he said it was such a good show that we should do a 75th, not an 80th, because a lot of the people are getting a bit older and might not be around. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Yes. A, yes. Ten years time, and even and Phil um, Phil Bashel from Dunsfolds. Phil was there with Rob Sprayson as well. Rob Sprayson's very well known, and in, in fact, Rob Rob does CKD in the in the UK. So they came over, and and they again they had such an amazing time. I mean, Phil even said he, he would like to get his amphib out to Australia. I don't know whether you know much about the amphib. I think it was it was trialed over here as an amphibious Land Rover. And then went back to the UK and the, the Australians never purchased one. But um, he's fully restored. And he said, if I can bring that to the 75th, that, you know, so we were trying to hold him to that. But then again, that was before COVID happened. So, Well, there's there's still time. There's still time. Yeah, yeah, there is. And I, and the thing with Land Rover as well, there's so many I would just, you know, for your, for your audience around the world, you know, land, since the production ended of the Defender, it's gone berserk. Land Rovers over here, yeah. you know, and Defenders mm. are the cool car to have, the hipster car, um, and even not, thank God, not Freelanders, but Discovery ones and hey, Discovery careful, two. Careful, about careful. Play, <laughs> going up in, actually, there's nothing wrong with the Freelander two. That's got a Puma diesel engine in it. That's a good car. There you go. It's underrated the Freelander two. Yeah, it's Freelander two. Now the Freelander one, on the other hand. <laughs> I, I'm an original Freelander one owner, so you know that's why I, I'm I, I'm a supporter of the original Freelander. Admittedly, it had lots of problems, but <laughs> I think of it fondly. Yeah, it did. And I mean, and they did have them in the Camel Trophy in '98, but only that was it. Well, yeah, and then <laughs> that's the, his, right. his claim to fame, isn't it? And then the Clamp Camel Trophy. <laughs> then, promptly then, they, then they learned their mistake, and, and yeah. <laughs> oh, actually, no, I think they had them in the G4 as well, didn't they? No, actually, G4 you're right. It was not in the Camel Trophy. It was in the G4. That was, uh, I don't think there were any Freelanders in the Camel Trophy. Was it no, 1998 was the, oh, was it? It was okay. Freelanders. Yeah. Maybe they were yeah. support vehicles. Yeah. <laughs> no, the, the Defender was a support vehicle. <laughs> Without the Defender, they wouldn't have got through. That's true. That's true, yes. <laughs> Some, something had to drag the Freelanders through the jungle. Yes. So, so the 75th anniversary event is... Uh, you're saying it's going to take place then around the snowy hydro location. That'll be in 2023. Is that a, do you have a specific date yet for that? It's you. It's, it's in the past. It's run at Easter. Okay. And I actually, I've got, I've had quite a few people from your neck of the woods, as we'd say, who would actually contact me saying, can we come over? Can we do something? We've got people saying, can we come on the Outback Heritage Drive? I'm thinking, well, you can't come in the country, but so I think, you know, hopefully and hopefully in the next six months when all these COVID is out of the way, uh, we can start doing further plans. Even um, Tim uh, Slesser, he's I've talked to him, and he wants to come, and we we will we'll pay for his flight. I mean, it'd be great to have him here. I mean, he's what, in his nineties, I think now, isn't he? So uh, late 80s, late late eighties. Is he well? Late but in a, in another year and a half, he'll be in his nineties. So yeah. So if we could get him here, and uh, that would be good. Is the event a, a week? Is it a weekend? Uh, how long? And, and what kind of activities to take place typically? Yeah, the seventieth was it, it basically it, it was a, over a public holiday, so yeah, three days. For, I think it was Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But running up to that, the clubs around Australia do their own things, so there might be a club will, will go out and do a, a four wheel drive day you know and run up to the snowy mountains some clubs have been doing how to repair your pto for example so it was quite the, the clubs were involved in that in that sense but the actual the event itself was well it was we tried to do the world record for the most amount of land rovers in one spot and i think we got 970 or something in the town and then this key i mean obviously we went as a business as well and i, I which was good, but you don't get to see a lot when you're working and you're on your feet from eight while five. So this time we're going to do something a lot different. We won't, we'll just have key cars on display. We'll have Oxford, we'll have a camel. In fact, there'll be an, hopefully another camel trophy. Um, and a few other little bits and bobs. You know, I've been a, a nice 
informal kind of event for us. We're not going there to sell, you know, shock absorbers and those kind of things. Right. Boring parts. R- rooftop tents and yeah. rooftop tents and but people look at but it's, and I think because Land Rovers have are certainly defenders that you know are very popular. There's a lot more younger people now who've come on board with the brand. And, you know, you, we talk to them and they go, oh, I've never heard of the 70th, but the 75th sounds amazing. So I think I think it'll be a good show, you know, mm-hmm. a good show. And, and you can go for a day or you can go, you know, you can stay for a week. It is, it is it's obviously, it's a two-day drive from, from Queensland. So we've got quite a long way to go, and obviously even further from Western Australia. Is there a website people can take a look at for details? There will be a website up at some point. At some point. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I'm not the organizer of it. In fact, a good friend of mine, another Englishman, he was uh, organized the 70th, but now he, he wasn't working at the time. So he had lots of time to do that. And um, he's now working for a Land Rover company. So I don't know, you know, how things are progressing with the 75th. I know the local council want to do it because it brings in so much money to the town. And Land Rover do come on board with that when they have their. Um, uh, you probably have one of those things where you drive your cars up and they tilt and teeter totter. You're talking like a teeter totter. Yeah, kind of thing. I think you. Yeah, this like a display team. I mean, I, I hope. I hope it. I mean, I, I've I've talked to the. the, the, the there's a councillor. He's just retired. He was the mayor of the town, and I talked to him uh, not so long ago, and he really wants it to go ahead. But we've just got to. Whether I'm involved, whether my friend's going to get involved, I don't know. But well, we'll certainly keep in touch with you. To f- so when as this we get closer and things start events yeah, and actually absolutely. start develop, we'll, we'll, we'll share with our listeners because I'm pretty sure that you know coming out of COVID, you just get that feeling that people are going to want to travel and go do things and get out and experience other parts of the world. And I think you know Land Rover people are probably going to do that. And there you may have a lot, number of Americans coming down. I think so. And you know, the, our event was, it was so good. I mean, you know, for land, for, for Nick Rogers, you know, director of Land Rover to say, wow, this is amazing. You know, one of the best things he's ever done. So, so, so hopefully there'll still be that fire there to, to, to for the 75th. Um, and yeah, you're right. People, I, I've been going back to England. I went back to um, Land, was it Land Rover Legends at Vista? Yes. Yeah, I didn't go, obviously. I went in 2019. That was a fantastic event, a really good event. And it's nice because I go back and I see people. I meet Mike, I meet Tom, and, you know, it's, sure. it, I, and that's that's the enthusiast. We I go there, and it's nice to see those people and see those old cars and, you know, and go around the Series 1 club and the Series 2 and the Army. And, yeah, and, and, that's, and that's what I've missed, especially with COVID, not being able to, to go to the U.K., I think it's just watch this space. Keep an eye on the website. There's obviously the Facebook page, Oxford uh, Oxford to Australia via USA and New Zealand, so people can jump onto there. There's lots of updates, uh, lots of content from, you know, where Oxford's been in the past as well. And anything which will be happening goes on that Facebook page as well. Justin, how did you get into Land Rovers? What, what was your... How did I get the disease? <laughs> how did you get the disease? Exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> I must admit, when I lived in England, I would have never really probably had a Land Rover. I used to like Land Rovers, obviously. But for me, I think in England, especially defenders, were more for fire, fire service or the police or the farmer before the Japanese came in and basically you know, decimated all that. But when I arrived in Australia 14 years ago, I'd been here about a year, and I thought, right, now's a good time because I wanted to go tour it. And, you know, I'm not going to buy – actually, I'll tell a lie. I did actually – we bought a Hilux. <laughs> nice. a mm-hmm. oh, yeah. I it, and it was, I always wanted a dual cab and I bought a double cab Hilux with a V6 in it. And it was the worst car I'd ever had. Oh, it, wow. it, it was, yeah, it was, it, it was like a tram to drive around corners. It was fast. It was just not, it wasn't, it didn't. So anyway, so we, I bought myself a 300 T. It didn't have a soul. No, See? it didn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It didn't. It didn't. And it's kind of like a zombie because it has no soul and you can't kill it. Well, yeah, they're indestructible, aren't they? (laughs) That's that's for certain. But yeah, I'm saying that. Even my new, I've got, I drive a new Defender and it's the best thing ever. It's a phenomenal vehicle. Um, It leaves the old Defender in the Stone Age, but it's not fair to compare the two. It's from a different time. But even that's got soul. I, I, I get in that car and as a defender, an old defender owner, I see these and it's got a couple of quirks and I like it. It's not perfect. As in 
there's just not not bad quirks, but there's just these little things which it does from time to time. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. That's a defender. Such as? <laughs> Do tell. Oh, kind of. Sometimes it's got has a bit of noise from the, like, the door seal. Okay. Which, All right. You know, and then sometimes when you put it into reverse, it doesn't. It, it, sometimes you just you've got to click it again. Just little things like that. And maybe what else is there? Um, does Does your right foot get wet when you drive in the rain? No, it's pretty it's pretty dry. Actually. All right. <laughs> then it then it's not it's a like, defender. You open it up and you see the door seals. This there's like they've gone over the top of the door seals. Like they must have spent millions. So we can't we can't let this one leak any water. Right. Right. But. But for me, anyway, yeah, but yeah, but, uh, going back to, so I bought a 300 TDI, which a lot of the purists say is the best defender ever to own because it's simple to fix, etc. And that was a lovely vehicle. And I did some outback traveling. That That's really why I, I bought a defender. We still think we had a, I think we had a golf as well at the time, which was fine. It's a good car. And then the Puma, which is the, obviously the last reincarnation of the defender mm. came out. It's um, the one we can't get yet. Yeah, not not twenty five years old, is it? Right. And then, the, well, the Puma actually had been out a little while because it came out in two thousand and seven. But they reintroduced the double cab as a high capacity pickup, which had always wanted the proper factory uh, tub on the back. So I think I, I got like, the first one in the country, and I kept that car for six years. Never had a problem with it. Just phenomenal. Just a really good car, and used that for the business as well because we start, started the business up about eight nine years ago. Um, and how I got into Land Rover business, actually, my original background, I used to do video production and I used to actually do work. We used to do filming for the BBC back in the day, match of the day and horse racing. And it was only when I came to Australia with um, my wife at the time and what do I do? And I did some video work here and then Hannibal Safari equipment, which I think you used to have Hannibal equipment. In the States, didn't you? There used to be a retailing. I believe there was. I, I've heard the name, certainly. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was South African. And he, I, I had his products actually on my Defender at the time, and I really uh, I loved the products, and I pushed it as much as I can, and he basically said, do you want to come and work for me? So that's how I kind of got into that four-wheel drive world um, and did lots of shows, which was good. I could travel around Australia. And then, yeah, and then I, we, we, we split company. We fell out with each other. We're still good friends now. And then I just, yeah, decided to set a business up selling Land Rovers parts and equipment. So you sell Land Rovers parts and equipment. And nice. There you go. New new or used? No, mostly new. We do mostly new. Um, it's it's a big industry over here. There's, there's a lot of competition, unfortunately, you know, and it's selling parts is... No, oh, it's, it's, it's hard. I'm going to be honest with you, it's quite hard work. But we, again, we know because we're passionate about Land Rovers, we're not just selling, you know, roof racks or oil filters or nuts and bolts. It's it's more, for me, it's more of that history. And, and that's why we support it as much as we can. Uh, we're just about to launch. We're, we're working with another company, not to say so much, but we're doing some very bespoke high-end defenders with uh, LS engines, Cummins engines, auto gearbox, and even a battery uh, electric nice. defender. So some some exciting projects in the next six months, um, which I'm really, really excited about, really excited about. Have, have you taken your new defender around Australia yet? Have you been able to? I don't know. In fact, I don't want to take it out to the outback because it's a nice car. <laughs> <laughs> but the good news is, the good news is, the dealer who we did the who Oxford was in the showroom are going to come on board and give us a new Defender to take out to the desert as a support vehicle, which is good, which will be good. Not that I wouldn't take. I'm going to take the Camel. The Camel Trophy is actually going to go out of the showroom. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I think it has to be done. Uh, I'm going to have some wrap put on the front of it, a clear coat, so it doesn't get any stone chips. Because it is a uh, nut and bolt restoration, so it's worth a lot of money. So, you know, I don't want to go and wreck it. It's not like Bob Ives' um, camel from the '89, you know, which has still got all the battle scars. This thing's, you know, showroom finish, so it's got to stay like that. But it will be amazing just mm. to actually take it out there. The irony is, it's too nice to use in a camel trophy competition now. <laughs> It is too nice. In fact, I wish I could afford an old camel, which I could go out and bush bash, as they say. And then I've got the one, the princess in the showroom. <laughs> so tell us more about this camel trophy that you own. 
Well, yeah, it's an interesting story. So, in fact, when I was back at the Land Rover Legends in 2019, uh, before COVID struck us, um, I actually, that's the first time I met Bob Ives at, at that show. And uh, I was the club was there, the Camel Trophy Club was there, and I was talking to them about, oh, I'm, you know, I'm really keen. And I was going to look at a Camel Trophy 1998 down in Bath in the southwest of England. Cut a long story short, I, I, the, the club said, well, do you want to meet up for drinks? That evening before you know, when you, before you go and look at this car, I'm like, yeah, cool. So we went we went down into Bath and we went for pizza and a few beers and I met Nick Cox and I forgot the other gentleman's name, but anyway, and we're talking about cars and I was showing them my cars and they said, oh, don't rush into buying that camel tomorrow because there's a gentleman in Scotland who has got one, but it's not for sale, but you never know. Okay, so we went to look at this one the next day. It was owned by a doctor, bless him, a dentist, sorry lovely chap it, it, it's got some medical condition and his his plans were to drive the camel down to uh, the middle east but because of his, his health he couldn't do that but he was he wanted quite a lot of money for the car and it needed a lot of work doing to it there was a lot of rust in the vehicle which really puts me off <laughs> i'm kind of like yeah, you know and and i i, I we, we sat down with him we had some cup of tea and biscuits and things and we agreed a price and I said, let me think about it. I said, I've got, and I've got something else to look at. Anyway, I rang this chap up in Scotland, an Englishman, and said, I hear you've got a camel trophy, but you, do you want to sell it? And I said, no, I'm in no rush to sell it. He said, but if I've, if I've get the right offer. So we talked and I thought, I don't want to talk him out of it. So I said, what do you want? And he said a price and I went, yeah, fine. I thought I would have given double that. <laughs> <laughs> I really wow. would. And, um, and I, that was unseen. And three days later, I flew back to Australia. And I'm like, oh, my God, I just I can't leave it. I bought a camel trophy. <laughs> and he sent me lots of photographs. And then I went back at the end of 2019, in September and October, and me and my father, we drove up to Scotland, and we had a, a, a dad and son road trip back in the camel, which was excellent. And then okay. I went to I went to, went to to Exmoor Trim, um, to see Exmoor Trim's production facilities. We are now, we are actually the agent for Exmoor Trim as well in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, so that's a good thing. So I went down there and we did a few things with them. Um, and then I put into storage for a year and, I, and it finally arrived December last year. What camel trophy did it serve in? And was so mine it is a, a 96 build, but was a 97 Mongolia support vehicle. For the UK, oh, support vehicle, okay. Yeah, yeah. So those the, the 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 competitors' cars for that event was the Discovery 300 TDI five door, uh, and the the one tens were support vehicles. It still it still counts, by the way. I mean, even the support vehicles they probably did worse things sometimes to keep up with the with the contestants. So. Yeah, and uh, if you've got a camel trophy, you've got to have a defender. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Far better than a disco. <laughs> Well, we a friend of the show, uh, Bill Burke, participated in the uh, '91 Camel Trophy, and uh, uh, he, that was a disco. So even though, but he, but he's a defender owner now. I would have I would if a disco if a disco came up, I would certainly have like one in my collection. Sure, you got to have one of each, right? Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What no, else? That, that, that was a full read. That the guy who did it he is very uh, you know meticulous about what he did, and, and it literally rebuilt that it, it, it had a bit of a check in history actually it got stolen like Land Rovers do in the UK some years back and it, it mm. went to to Spain and it was a it was a lad and his dad who were stealing cars in the UK and sending them to their workshop in Spain and you know cloning them and do all this kind of stuff. And it actually the, the my car was actually painted green. Oh, oh. And it had, yeah and it was so it was stripped of all its bits oh. painted green and it's only be, it's a funny story because the, the the dad caught his son in bed with his girlfriend and it came out in the press. It was a big thing. And that's then they found out and, and then they admitted about this stealing cars in the UK and sending them. And the guy who um, I bought the camel off, he, he knew it was a camel and he went down there and they went inside and they could see the original paint. So it went back to the UK and he literally, it had to be a, a nut and bolt restoration um, and he managed it, to, it would have to be at that point. Yeah, yeah. There was he couldn't have not just left it green, but so it was. That's why it was fully restored. Gotcha. 
damage. So the person you bought it off of did the restoration following it. Correct. It's been stolen and then it was stripped down. Yes. Okay. Was everything returned to the UK? Did they find all the parts? Most of the, it, it, they found the, the roof rack on a, on a scrap, in a scrap yard around the corner. Oh, wow. Kind of. uh. So but there were certain things, and I think it was, a, a, it was things like on the front of the bumper on, on those, the, the winches on my event, the super winch, which was a, um, a factory option from Land Rover as well as one. And there's a metal plate, and these, which says super winch on it, and they're basically impossible to find. And he actually went to super winch, and he said, have you got any? And he went, nah, he said, we, we don't sell them in all years. And they went, hold on, we've got an old display board we used to take to shows. And he brought, and he went, that's the badge. So he was nice. really to get, and, and the stickers and the decals are in the right position. And, you know, everything is, is exactly, he, he went to town on the car. He made it proper. Right, right. <laughs> Had to do a proper restoration at that point. So Yeah, yeah. And it's, and it's, 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 it's amazing when you look at it. I mean, and it's a great thing. People love love a cam. I mean, other than that, I think some people want to drive it, they probably look at it and go, what does he do? Camel racing? Because a lot of people won't have a clue what the camel trophy is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Even even Land Rover, in the younger generation who are coming into Land Rovers wouldn't have a clue what the camel trophy is. So you do drive it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I do drive it, yeah. That's good. What else is in your collection? Uh, Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's on you loan. Little, yeah, you don't get to keep that one forever, Pat. No, I don't. I don't I'd love to drive that back to England. Um, other, I've got a Camel, we've got the new Defender, and I've also got a Series 3 Takar Wanton Fire Engine, X-Royal Navy. Ooh. Oh, right dude, on. tell us more. Oh, <laughs> tell us more. Um, this is a Land Rover podcast. We like these details. You understand. Well, this is, this is another one. So uh, as a young lad, my uh, I had a lot of my family used to work in the military and my cousin used to work for the RAF. And I always remember going to the airfield, big airfield in Finningley, Doncaster. It's now a commercial airport. Um, one of the longest runways in the UK. You could actually land the space shuttle there. It's, it's, it's that big. And I always remember seeing these red Takar fire engines driving around. I'm like, that's a cool, that's a cool truck. That's so cool. And I'm, you know, and I'm never going to get one. And then obviously you grow up and whatever, and they, they, they went out of service and got solo. And I was on a Facebook forum a few years back and we were talking about fire trucks and I said, Oh, I'd love one of them. And this guy sent me a message and said, I've got one for sale if you're interested. Oh. And I was like, too right. I am. <laughs> and so it, and he was, a, he had a, also had a Morris thousand van, which is ex bomb disposal. So he was into his old classic cars his wife had passed away and that was their passion going to shows and things. So he kind of lost that love a little bit and his cars were down in Devon, um, South, Southwest England. And he used to have a mechanic who'd go in once a month and just start them up and things. And anyway, we agreed a deal and I paid, I think I paid 6,000 pounds for it, which I thought was a good price because I'd always wanted a one ton Takar Land Rover. They're just so cool. And yeah, I brought it here and there's a few little things I had to do on it. Um, yeah, I, I must admit, it does, it's up for sale at the minute because you just don't use it. It's oh. it just, I know it's it's probably done three hundred miles in five years. It's not, but you still have it. Not, I have it, and I don't know. I kind of it's cool. It's cool. I mean, it's got the searchlight, the blue lights. It's got. I've got all the proper outfits. The old from the sixties. You know, they used to wear for rescuing mm. pilots. Did you track down any of its history? So you said it was in the Royal Navy? Yeah, yeah. So mine was um, at um, Royal uh, Naval Station called Rose in Cornwall, which which I think is still is still a military um, is for the for the Royal Navy. So yeah, it's and I think it was demobbed in about oh ninety one something like that. But there's not I, there was there was about seventy made for the three UK branches. So the the Army had them, the Navy had them, and the RAF had them. Um, and I think there's maybe 10 or 15 left in the world. So it's a pretty rare truck, but it's not as sexy as a short wheelbase canvas back series car. You can take the wife out to, to coffee and the lunch at the right. weekend, you know, a, a big old fire engine on 900 by 16 tires. Right. Mm-hmm. It's, standard. it's, it's not, so that's why it's not. So, it sounds sexy to me. Well, it, it, it is, but I think it's a niche market. You know, it's not. Yeah. Her- Harold has a Series 3 RAF ambulance. Oh, no, okay. I do not. I have an Army ambulance. Oh, I, my apologies. It's the Army ambulance. 
Oh, the one with, has he got the, the, the bull bar on the front, the crash bar? Uh, no, that'd be the RAF. Oh, yeah, yeah. But Army didn't thing. use those, but yeah, yeah, it's the Magic Marshal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're nice. I like those. Oh, yeah, it's it's fun. I'm enjoying my 130 more. more at the moment, but yeah. <laughs> I, I've got a, a ex-Australian 130 I just bought last year. Oh, okay. it, it now has the uh, 2.8 liter Cummins in it. That's a good engine. Which, yeah, turned up the fun factor a bit. Very much so. And are, are Defenders popular in the States now? Have they, have they grown more so like they have in the rest of the world? Yes. Uh, yeah, on steroids. Yes. Yeah? It's yeah. a cool car to have. They've become ridiculously expensive here. A couple of years ago, then Defenders could be imported, the 25-year rule. And we had a small yeah. number that are North American spec that were around. And though they're, those ones now command double what double the price of what they were originally on the showroom. Oh, keep going. It's more like it's more like quadruple, dude. It's I mean, you you can the last of the line 2016 because I mean, my ex partner we we got a 90 for her um, cost us 49,000 Australian. That car I could clear 80 85 easy yep. selling it. It's just, I, and, and there's no sign of, of the prices going down either. I don't know when this bubble will burst. I don't know either. No, that's a good question. Yeah, that's hard to say. It is hard to say. It's an excellent question. But it's not the car for the average man. It's, 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 it's yeah. out of that affordable range as well, if that makes sense. I mean, same with Series 1s. I mean, you look at, I mean, that bubble in, in the UK is certainly burst, I think, you know, and, and Series 2s and Series 3s are, are in flavour. And they're more of a usable vehicle than a Series 1. Here, we see in figures of fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 for Series vehicles. And then our Range Rovers as well, you know, all the Range Rover classics. In North America, the, new def- the old Defender, excuse me, is similar to what the new Defender is, which is a lifestyle vehicle. And that that's, even though they've not, you know, there's no, certainly no marketing of the old Defender that way. It, I think it's picked up that whole SUV overlanding, off-roading, even though we don't call it that here in North America, uh, typically. I think it just seems to have brought that, you know, that lifestyle thing, you know, folks are taking it. You, you see commercials with defend with old defenders in, in commercials of people going, you know, to, uh, you know, going to a campsite in the remote part of Montana, you know? And uh, so it's just all part of that, again, a, a lifestyle feel. Yeah. They certainly, they certainly use the old defender, a lot of companies in advertising now, because it's the cool car to have. Yes. Um, but the new defender, I mean, I'd just give a, a, a good figure here is, the first 50 that my local dealer sold, only two people currently drove the old Defender mm-hmm. right. out of that 50. Right. And 70% right. of them had never even owned a Land Rover. Yep. Sounds about the um, same. I would think it's the same here. Yeah. And I think that was done deliberately to bring more people to the brand. Yeah, oh, yes. the old Defender wasn't it wasn't land rover didn't weren't making money on it you know yeah they sold lots didn't they in the last two years just like you know when they announced concord was going to stop concord made more money in these last two years of, right. of, of, of use <laughs> than it ever did but i think i think i certainly think land rover with the new defender have got it absolutely spot on and i and i can say that and i've got both old and new and i see in that new defender and i can see these cues to the past and I don't think somebody who's never had an old Defender would see that. They just think it's a trendy car to have. I need one of those on my drive. You know, that, you know, it, next year it could be a new BMW, couldn't it? Or a new Merc. And it's, it's comfortable. It goes down the road. I can, I can accelerate. I can merge onto the highway. Yeah. And, and look, but young, this gener- the younger generation don't want to sit in an old, generally an old Defender, you know, it's not, an old Defender was quite, Specific, what you know, and I know a lot of I talk to lots of women who are, oh, I don't like that Defender, I don't like this, you know, but they'll drive an Evoque or they'll have a Freelander or you know, whatever, a Range Rover, yeah, you know? the, the, the girl rovers. It's comfortable, it has to do with comfort. I mean, I can actually have a conversation with somebody on the phone in my new Defender, I could never do that in the old one or a Series 3, exactly. Yes, <laughs> or a Series, but the Grenadier is here, it's, it's out in the desert being trialed. I think the Grenadier is gonna, I like the Grenadier. I think it, it it's going to fit in where Defender, well, Land Rover haven't gone with the Defender, and we're go and we're going to either. No, they're not. They, that, that does you and I and I think and I hopefully that the Grenadier, you know, great for military. I mean, look at the British Army, seven and a half thousand wolves still in service. They're all past the use by date. Let's be honest. 
what a great vehicle they could they could do. The Grenadier would suit that perfectly. We'll find out soon enough. You know, certainly a modernized old Defender. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> and again, if it's comfortable and you can go down the highway and you can merge safely and keep up with traffic, these are important things for a, certainly a newer buyer uh, trying to get into, into it. Those are important considerations. Yeah, and, and Jim Radcliffe, who owns that company, I mean, he's a fanatical, Yes, you know, he, he owns JUE, you know, which we try to, we might even get here for the 75th. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, he is, he's, he, he's, he's, he's seen, obviously, you know, he, well, he tried to buy the old, the rights for the old defender, didn't he? And Land Rover went, no, <laughs> <You know? laughs> no way. We're not going to do anything with it, but no, you can't have it. No, and I did actually hear, I don't know whether you guys did that. There was talk about them rebuilding the old defender in India. India. I don't, I never would see that happen. No. Cause I mean, they were moving the whole brands moving upscale and had to, and, and moving into certainly here in North America as a luxury brand. Cause they command high prices. You know, you can buy a new defender for the same price. You can buy an old defender now. Yeah, that's true. You can hear. And, and there's a, a big, I mean, I'm considering selling mine and making maybe 20 grand profit <laughs> on mine. Yeah. Because people yeah. don't want to wait 18 months and there's the problems with the chip shortages and you can't have head up display and you can't have this and you can't have that. So mm -hmm. I know. I know. Yep. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I think you're probably a member of the uh, new defender group on Facebook and you just, it's the, the crossover between the people on that group and all the other groups say the heritage groups, there's very little crossover of, of those folks. Mm. It's all those. And then, you know, the ones that are posting, you know, I just got my new defender. It's very exciting. I've just ordered it. I'm waiting 18 months. What, you know, or what tire should I get? What, you know, what color would I like? And so there's a, a lot of those folks are just all new people. And that's just, that's where Land Rover's going. Yeah, I, I think they were closing the door on on the past. I mean, you know, there was some discussion at one point of Land Rover being a a larger car production capability, uh, but you know they had problems in the last couple of years at the uh, with the end of Space uh, Run as CEO, and I think that quashed the, all those ideas, and then and then COVID hit and made it even worse to become a, a large car manufacturer. As long as they, I mean, as long as they support the heritage of the brand, I mean, and, and look at Land Rover Classic. I mean, I was surprised actually it took that long for Land Rover to, you know, to build that facility. I mean, certainly uh, BMW and Ferrari and Maserati and Mercedes have been doing those restorations for many years. You can send your car back to, you know, whatever Stuttgart or wherever it is. So Land Rover, I think we're quite late coming to that party. Um, I don't know whether you've, have you been to that facility in the UK? Uh, have not. They were going to build one here in North America in uh, South Carolina, but COVID struck and that uh, that quashed that that whole idea because there was certainly a market it's here for it. Pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah. I've seen, <laughs> we've seen the pictures and and heard about it. Yeah, it's absolutely impressive. I agree with you. I agree with you. But it all goes back to money, which is the same reason why the Defender had not been updated. There was the you know the money to the money to keep the things going. And where are you going to put your money? You only have so much money, and they you know where are you going to put it? They had a whole, that you knew they had we're going to have to build a whole new factory for this new vehicle. You know, and then and not to mention development costs and BMW and Mercedes are certainly way bigger car, car manufacturers than Land Rover ever has been. I mean, and look at look at the old Defender. I mean, the works the works V8. I mean, phenomenal, but oh, yeah. 150,000 pounds, <laughs> yeah. three hundred thousand yeah. Australian. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and, you know, it's a hundred thousand, a hundred thousand dollars here. I think for the V8 new Defender V8 coming and a, a special edition. You know, then. So they're having that. Then they have the special bond editions. Now they're, they're making what 300 around the world. Those are, those are, those are a little pricey too. And we don't get those. They know. In fact, the, the Range Rover, they did the anniversary. I don't know whether you got the, the 50th anniversary for the Range Rover and they had two, they had two colors. There was the banana, banana, what is it? Banana gold, the gold one yes. and the blue one. Mm -hmm. We haven't got any of those over here. Oh, okay. I think, yeah, well, there were, that was a limited number. Maybe that was, yeah, maybe that's just, you guys unfortunately didn't get included. Sorry about that. Yeah, they don't, they're a bit <laughs> slack when it comes to limited editions in Australia. <laughs> they don't get the nice ones. <laughs> well, you know. Even the Camel Trophy, the Camel, the, the trap, what they're not called Camel Trophy, is it Camel, Camel Classic or such? They, 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 re, oh. they did an old defender, didn't they, this yes, year? Yes, yes, right. I, you're, I think you're right. It was the Camel Challenge. Was it Camel Challenge or something? Yeah, something, something like that. Yeah. 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 They weren't proper camels, though. There we go. <laughs> anything else in your inventory we need to know about? What Anything interesting behind you in your cabinet there that you're showing off your oh, uh, your toy collection? Model Land Rovers. That's, that's another addiction. Yes. <laughs> 
Looks like I see a camel trophy there. Looks like some defenders. Uh, there's a car trailer. Number plates there. Nice. You've got a camel trophy number plate CT97. This is my this is my home office. Yes. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. So yeah, no, we we do like to collect our merchandise and our little trinkets. The nice thing about the small ones is they they leak smaller quantities of oil on your floor. <laughs> Well, Small drip trade. If they're if they're leaking oil, you may have a problem. Well, as you know, with the large size Land Rovers, it's when they stop leaking that's when you have a problem. Well, that's, yeah, that's, that, that, that's there's a word true. for that. The word is empty. If it's not leaking oil, there's something wrong with it. Right. <laughs> yes. And, and Oxford certainly leaks a lot of oil. <laughs> and did you have to do any <laughs> special work to Oxford yet? Anything? Any special repairs or any special maintenance? We we fitted a new. Um, um, fuel gauge because the fuel gauge which I think is a good thing to do especially when he starts going on his travels you can't just be putting a wooden stick in the fuel tank every time um, <laughs> and, and you also some, can't switch to the other tank because that part doesn't work we're actually going to probably get that tank fixed I think um, that's really? probably a little job yeah we'll get that tank fixed um, well, that's an upgrade yeah yeah, we've done the, we've done the electrics um, which needed sorting out the only uh, the only really? downside is really 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 slow, and is I think there's it's something to do with it. It needs a new needle um, for the carb. So that's I mean we want to mean slow. I mean I've got other series Land Rovers will just fly past him if he's going up a hill. Yeah, uh, yeah, it uh, it drove pretty slow here. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, it's not a racing car. <laughs> so if we can sort that out, that would be yeah, that's really it. I think. Um, the, the, the paint's coming off here. I talked to Adam about the paint because I said, you know, one day there'll be no paint left on this car. It's literally falling off. And I think the more it's cleaned as well, and you know, yeah. I was quite concerned with the pressure washing at the port because they use some pretty powerful machines. Yeah, to that clean. stuff will take the paint right off a new car. Yeah, but we've we've said, you know, we, said we might try a very clear lacquer, so we're going to try a little bit on a bit we can't see, and we'll see how that actually works to keep the paint from continually falling off. What about a clear wrap? Oh, I don't know. I just, uh, I just the thought I had in my head. Yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I think when you peel the wrap off, it's going to take the rest of the paint with True. it. I think nope. it's, that would be a one way deal. Leave the wrap on. What do, if yeah, it's going to but, preserve the paint and the look. Yeah. But if the I wrap mean, gets chewed up by stones and other, other stuff that you need to be able to remove it and replace it. Yeah, true. I think a yeah. lacquer might be the way to go. Like I, I, think so. I think so, too. Because if not, it, it won't have any paint left in another 10 years' time. <laughs> It'll be better off. Yeah. <laughs> Repaint it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, may, maybe it has to go back into storage, flat-packed on, uh, on, Hel- on San Helena Island and w- wait again for another 60 years for someone to find it. It probably goes to a museum, I think. That's where it needs to go. It, needs to, it needs to keep circling the globe, as I think Adam intended. And let, let people use it and, and let people see it. I think that's it's a, I think that's a great legacy for it. Oh, we did. Just one last thing I'll just remember. We did get a spot on the local news as well, which was good. So the Channel 9, not that I like Channel 9, but anyway. But they did a spot. They came down, filmed Oxford, which was good, and did a segment on Prime time evening news so that's it's good and we'll, we'll, we'll have lots more events you know planned in the next year and there'll be loads of media exposure so we will keep you posted i and you're invited back anytime to, on the podcast talk about oxford and its adventures in australia we hope you come back and, and tell us more because we like to keep tabs on oxford as it's going i think i think the outback will do something specially it's hopefully six six to seven months when we do his outback Excellent. We could even do a little bit of a, a feed from the outback. It'd be quite good, wouldn't it? Uh, you, Ooh, we're yeah. holding you to that, Justin. We're going to hold you to yeah, that. Yeah, I think that'd be cool. That would be Actually very cool. Actually, live, live, live from the desert <laughs> with Oxford. <laughs> All right, <laughs> stay tuned. Live from the desert, Oxford, in Australia. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. Justin, thanks for coming on the program. We'll have links in the show notes to the things we discussed to once you once you send me the YouTube link. Yep. Thank you very much for coming on. Appreciate the, appreciate your time. Good to talk, guys. You take care. And before we end the show, I want to give you a review of Mar 2021 and give you a preview of Mar 2022. Mar 2021 took place at the Wheatland Farm, and I 
Come to find out it's the last time at Wheatland Farm. And we'll talk a moment about uh, where it may go for 2022. Mar this year, it was a uh, weather was actually perfect. It was really nice. Uh, weather wise, I took the my Defender down to the site and Bill Burke was there, Jeff Aronson, Ralph uh, Sarek. Those are names you may have uh, heard about, uh, folks that were there. And Bill Burke was putting on a, you know, his, he did his off-road class. <laughs> Bill Burke was being Bill Burke. Bill Burke was being Bill Burke, yes. In, in every possible way. <laughs> I got to ride with Bill off-road, and that was a lot of fun. Enjoyed that. Did he get stuck? No. I, I'm told he'll do that, but only on special request. <laughs> That's right. That's true. That's true. Now, there was no getting stuck. Uh, Jeff Aronson was there, and he had a loner new Defender 90 from Land Rover North America. Of course he did, <laughs> because he's Jeff Aronson. And he did let me take it for a little tool around the uh, the grounds there and it was it's really nice but the the thing i know is i don't know if it's just the 90 and i've, I've been around a 110s before i've been around uh some of the new defenders but for some reason the 190 felt huge just really big it has a lot of presence and i don't know if it's the paintwork or if it's the you know it's maybe the way it's stylized it, it it's not broken up on the side because it's just like one straight body panel and the nine there's the 110 you know there's some breaks in it um visually anyways but the 90 just seemed big to me like really big i, w- I wonder if that's just because it is so much bigger than the the legacy 90 and so you know, in that sense it just seems big i don't know i'm not really sure it just has it has a lot of a lot of presence is the, what came to my mind when I was like, this is like really big. And I've, you know, I've certainly seen the new defenders before and been around them, but this one in particular seemed large. And uh, Ralph Sarek was uh, also there. He uh, has Sarek Auto Works, right? He had his modified new Defender 90 that is coil sprung, has done modifications, added some body uh, body armor to it has the the winch mounted uh externally on the front and uh so he talked about that and it was really cool to see you've probably seen pictures probably on the internet it was really cool to see in in person it's not air suspension which is kind of unique also well one less thing to go wrong i guess <laughs> yeah. he, he, he i was down at the overland expo the following week and he was there for that and i didn't really get a close-up look at his truck but i did see it it was there yeah, did a nice job with it with the things he's done. And you know, it's certainly that's part of his business to sell, you know, third party extra equipment for for that. So uh, you know, it's for him, it's not just something he enjoys, but also you know, part of the business. But he's he's done a nice job with it. Well, you know, it's, if that's it's what a you're halo looking for. for him. Yeah, absolutely. Showcases what they can do. And then there was the RTV course. That was a lot of fun. Helped uh, Jeff out with that. And as I said, got to drive the D90 that he had and uh they ended up having a family photo, group photo. There was probably over 100 trucks there. Uh, they did that because this is supposed to be the, the last time at Wheatland Farm. And there were six new defenders there as part of the photo. That was kind of cool. I think uh, from the Center Steer account, I did repost that photo on Facebook. Uh, there's actually a video, excuse me, from the drone that, that they had there. So you can check that out. Did they have the the blindfold competition? Did not do the blindfold competition this year, no. They had the RTV course off-roading, of course, is, is in the normal way that they do things. And we had the Saturday night dinner and they had the auction. I wonder if maybe they canceled the blindfold race due to the controversy of, of you winning it last time while listening to Bob. <laughs> was that, was probably the Scottish Bob. Scottish. I mean, come on, that can't have happened. <laughs> You must have been able to see. Oh, I must have. That's exactly it. I was the only one able to translate. What are you talking There's about? There's no way I can understand what Bob's saying well enough to, to, to take instruction in real time from him. I need like a minute to process everything he says. And meanwhile, I'm, I'm looking at stuff rushing at. No way. I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you should get extra points for that. I think so. It increased the difficulty factor, especially over walkie talkie. Hence, I think people thought you were cheating because there's no way that anybody could do that. Well, I, I'll let you in on a secret, Hill. The the walkie talkie did the translation. <laughs> oh, it was a Google talkie. Okay. There we go. Google talkie. <laughs> Well, maybe at the new Mar, next year's Mar, maybe they'll, they'll they'll bring that back. So next year's Mar, Mar 2022, I'm calling it right now, back to Pearl's Pond, question mark. During while I was at Mar this year, they let folks know that this is the last year at uh, Wheatland Farm. And uh, so David Short did provide me with information on what's coming up for next year. So I'm going to read you these points and... Uh, so you can prepare yourself for Marv next year. You know, Rove hosts Mar uh, at Pearl's Pond from 1999 to, uh, to 2007. 
And I think I was there for some, from 2002, 2003. I was there for about five years for those. I, I was there for the 07. Okay. The first Mars were held at Penland Farm. I guess that's before Pearl's Pond. Pearl's Pond management has been passed down within the family, the Adamson family. They own the property. The new management has established the Little George Rod and Gun Club. It's a fishing and hunting club. And they have a website, which is the Little George rodandgunclub.com. Well, that adds an extra challenge to the Mar then if you're negotiating the trails whilst being shot at. (laughs) Pearl's Pond is located in uh, Buckingham County. It's about an hour and a half hours west of Richmond, Virginia, an hour east of uh, Wintergreen. It's uh, about three hours from New York City. Oh, he nicely added six hours from Pittsburgh. Thank you for that, David. Oh, he adds here too, 3,700 miles from Sully Hall. I guess I'm assuming that's straight line and not uh, not on a boat. The property <laughs> the property has been expanded to include new land. Some of the old trails still exist. Some of the old trails have been moved or altered to allow for growth in the fields to attract birds and wildlife management. Not all of the old camping areas remain available. The new land will need new trails cut. New camping areas will need to be created. The property has a permanent pavilion with lights and power. The Rove, that's Rover Owners of Virginia Board, has expressed intent to move Mar to Pearl's Pond for 2022. And he made a point of bolding and underlining expressed intent. <laughs> Letter of intent day. We haven't signed anything yet. The Rove Board will be having the first of what is expected to be several meetings at the Pearl's Pond site in November. The purpose of these site visits is to evaluate feasibility and to work out event hosting details with the land management in writing. The Rove board will release final details, and as we get them, check rove.org for all the updates. And finally, all of Rove is very grateful and appreciative of Sam Moore and his survivors for allowing Rove to use Wheatland Farm for as long as they did from 2013 to 2021. That was Mar 2021 and Mar 2022. If you are in North America, especially if you're in the East Coast, it's an excellent event to come out to and attend. It always, always a good time is had. And the inspiration for the Center Steer podcast. Absolutely correct, sir. Thank you. So you can you can go to the Mar and you can find yourself a campfire. You can sit down. You can swill a beer or a whiskey. You can tell some lies and you can experience what led to the podcast. Which, interesting, Harold, you said is uh, much like what uh, I did with Bill Burke at Mar. <laughs> we sat around, had a couple beers. We hope you enjoyed show number 103. Uh, thanks to Morgan and thanks to Harold for coming on, guys. Thanks again, as always. Yep. Thank you. Apparently, Dixon is still late uh, as we record this, and I'm checking email. Nothing from Dixon. Apparently, he uh, probably completely forgot. The the skyscraper has thrown a rod. And thanks to Justin Burton for telling us about Oxford in Australia. Keep a watch on the podcast here. Uh, hopefully, Justin will be back and keep keeping us up to date on Oxford in Australia. And also, thanks to the One True Packs for his continued production support. In honor of the Land Rover's 75th birthday, you are invited to bring your Land Rover, specifically series and defenders, to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix in 2023. This is your continuous a reminder that it's coming up and you now have 20 months to prepare. Mind you, if you really don't want to bring your series or defender and, and you have your heart set on bringing your disco or your Range Rover, we will not turn you away for that simple oversight. Visit our website, centersteer.com to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's podcast. If you're listening to the podcast on our website, download a podcast app and subscribe. So you have the podcast automatically delivered. We post a new podcast at the end of every month. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, email, and and voicemail, you can directly support the show at patreon.com slash center steer, just like Bob, Jeff, and Kristen did. Thank you very much to them. You can buy us a t-shirt sticker or buy us a tea or brown water. Click on store on the menu of our webpage. Bob, we're talking to you, the brown water boy. I also had some brown water with Bob at Mar. Yeah, it all, all comes together, doesn't it? And, and did he tell you where said brown water came from before you ingested it? Uh, it was sealed in a bottle, so I did, did not uh, was not concerned. Okay. Thank you for listening. We'd love to hear from you and what you're up to in your Land Rover. Click on voicemail on the website and let us know. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast, maybe around a campfire, maybe with a beer. Or a whiskey. Lies are optional. And you may now resume your important things. doing hydro on the fjords.